This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 274 of the program. Today is Friday, January 22nd, and before we get started, I want to take some time to thank all of the people who make this show possible, all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving us, and that includes Amanda Soul, BG, Camille DePaulo, Christina Sandage, Dale Story, DGLSGRTHS, Diana Libman, Eric, Ida Webbs, Israel Vasquez, Jeffrey Williams, Leona Rosales, Lizbeth Raphael, Matt DeJohnny, Patrick Fredericks, Raptor Sloth, JT123, Rob Palles, Scott Johnson, Sonic Goku Jurin, Hewan B, and Vahide Hagigi. Thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. So this week is uh, the end of an era and the start of a new one. The Trump era is over. So, of course, we will celebrate the end of the Trump era and we'll talk about how he spent his remaining months in office doing absolutely nothing and how election misinformation actually decreased substantially after he was banned from social media. Additionally, Joe Biden is now the president of the United States. I'll give you my thoughts after his inauguration. We'll talk about his day one executive orders and the conflicts of interest that exist within his administration that I think you need to know about. Also, Budget Committee Chairman Bernie Sanders has some big plans for the first 100 days of Biden's presidency. And also, members of the pro-Trump cult QAnon are trying to wrap their heads around the fact that Joe Biden was inaugurated and he wasn't actually arrested, which is what they thought was going to happen come Inauguration Day. So that's what we've got on the agenda for today's episode. Let's get right to it. It's kind of a lighter episode, but nonetheless, you know, it's nice to have less things happening that are actually conse- consequential rather than like chaos every single week. So, you know, uh, let's get right to it. With the exception of complaining about the election and inciting a violent insurrection, Donald Trump hasn't really done much of anything since losing the election. Um, he has golfed, but I mean, he, he just he's given up even trying to govern. And that's that's an issue, right? You know, I'm a little bit torn on this. On one hand, like, I want him to go away because anytime he speaks and makes a public appear- appearance, he just fans the flames further. But at the same time, during a global pandemic, we do need competent leadership at the federal level, especially when we're rolling out a vaccine, when we need federal leadership to deliver, you know, money to states, aid to states. So, you know, It's a mixed bag, but it still is really stunning that Trump has just basically gone MIA. In fact, it's been six days since he's made a public appearance at the time I record this video. And CNN did a segment on this that kind of puts it all into perspective about his overall schedule since the election. President Trump hasn't been seen publicly in six days, and his schedule has been mostly empty since Election Day. If you take a look from Tuesday, November 3rd until today, more than half of the time, 46 days, No public events at all have been listed on the president's schedule, but Trump has spent 16 days golfing on one of his own courses. CNN contributor Garrett Graff is joining us now. He's the author of several books, including The Threat Matrix, Inside uh, Mueller's FBI, among them. So, Garrett, if, you know, little to nothing is on his schedule, what the heck has he been doing since the election? Uh, Well, what we know so far is that he has spent a lot of time grousing, um, you know, talking to uh, aides, friends, his dwindling pool of allies, complaining about this election, complaining uh, and trying to pressure election officials to try to overcome it. 
Um, and now we understand, you know, in the 10 days or so since the insurrection at the Capitol, uh, when he has even gotten more toxic, as Caitlin Collins was just saying, uh, he has turned his focus to trying to squeeze out a few final actions as president. Uh, we are expecting in the next 48 hours at some point to see as many as 100 pardons come down from the president. Um, and this is uh, something that uh, typically all presidents do in their final hours, but no one has ever abused the pardon power as much as President Trump has. So everyone's waiting with bated breath to see who ends up on that list. First of all, let me just say a side note, Garrett's book looks like porn for resistance liberals. And I'm so glad we're past the days where liberals are like worshiping Robert Mueller. They were like trying to like sexualize Robert Mueller and it was just really creepy and weird. So I hope that we can move, you know, past that because those days were some really dark times in American history. <laughs> I, I couldn't resist. I had to, like, make a note about his book. Uh, but putting that aside, we actually do know who Trump is planning to pardon. And uh, the first individual who will benefit from a Trump pardon is rapper Lil Wayne. This is according to Double XL magazine. Uh, Trump's administration is currently preparing paperwork to pardon Lil Wayne. Now, if you're wondering why, out of all of the rappers, he's choosing Lil Wayne and not, like, Bobby Shmurda or a BG, well, it's easy. It's because he's basically repaying a favor. Uh, Lil Wayne basically endorsed him, you know, indirectly. It was a tacit endorsement, but nonetheless, you know, it was a nod to Donald Trump, and Donald Trump remembers that. Lil Wayne tweeted this out during the 2020 election. Just had a great meeting with Donald Trump. Besides what he's done so far with criminal reform, the Platinum Plan is going to give the community real ownership. He listened to what we had to say today and assured he will and can get it done. So, you know, Trump remembers that. And uh, Trump is uh, most likely, I'm assuming, going to pardon his allies and people who did favors for him. Like he's going to use whatever time to just like make sure that he set, sets himself up and his allies up for the future. But like these 100 pardons and, you know, commuting sentences, if if we're talking about like nonviolent drug offenders, I would have no problem with that. But if we're just talking about like this, this cronyism where Trump is repaying debts and favors to people, I think that's pretty messed up. But when it comes to the end of the Trump era, I really hope that folks see that this was never about America or the American people. This was always about Donald Trump. Like this, this is kind of a mask off moment to have a president like disappear, go MIA because he lost an election and he's butthurt about that. Like this should prove to folks that he, he never cared about you. This was always about him. This was a personal project. Like, you often hear Chuds talk about how, well, you know, he was well off, he was rich, he didn't have to become president, but he did because he cared about America. That's bullshit. I don't think Trump ever expected to become president. He was running for president as a vanity project. There were numerous reports that that was the case, and that, that would be like the launching pad for some type of news network or TV network or something along those lines, but he never cared, and this shows it. Like, now that he's not going to be in power... And he won't get credit for the things that he does, like if he puts in place an actual cohesive plan to competently roll out the distribution of the vaccine. You know, he he probably thinks, oh, well, I'm not going to get credit. Joe Biden will get credit. So why would I care? Like he never cared. But I mean, his his supporters are are in a cult, so they're not going to see him golfing for 16 days during a global pandemic since losing the election as a sign that he doesn't care about anyone but himself. They're not going to look at him pardoning his allies as a sign that he doesn't care about anyone but himself and those in his inner circle. You know, this is a very deeply narcissistic and selfish individual and his supporters just are never going to see that. And you'd think that if they were going to see it, it'd be now when he's gone MIA, when, you know, if you truly cared, you could be using these last days to make a difference. You know, you'd see some kind of sad posts of his supporters, like he'd complain about losing the election and that it was stolen from him. And then his supporter would respond with basically, okay, yeah, the election was stolen, but we really need a stimulus. Can you do that for us with the remaining time that you have? Like I'm paraphrasing, of course, but you'd see you'd see the screenshots of this. And, you know, this really is a cult. They'll never abandon him. They won't take that as a sign that maybe he doesn't actually care. Maybe he's just a self-serving 
narcissist. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't matter because it's all coming to an end soon. And uh, whether or not the Trump era itself is over, that is yet to be determined. I think that Trump's influence within the Republican Party is waning largely due to the Capitol insurrection. But, you know, we'll have to wait and see. I think that the Republican Party will adapt and kind of embrace some of Trump's tactics while not like being overtly Trumpian. But, you know, it's almost over and he's he's just sulking. He's not doing Jack's shit. And I think that this wouldn't be a story if the circumstances in the country weren't so bleak. But the fact that he's not doing anything, it, it just it, it speaks volumes like his silence is deafening. But again, I'll be honest, part of me wants him to kind of like hide his face because anything that he says, like it, what is that going to do realistically for the country? He's not going to help heal wounds. He's not going to bring people together. He's not going to act in a competent way that puts us in a better position. It's just, so maybe it's a good thing. I don't know. But either way, I, I think it is still very telling that he's not doing anything. So Joe Biden is set to be sworn in on Wednesday, tomorrow by the time that most of you see this video, and he's already planning a number of day one executive orders that I think are objectively good. Um, now, I do have a criticism of Joe Biden that I will be addressing, but I will give him credit where it's due. Like, my goal here going forward is not to be a hack. If Joe Biden does something that I disagree with, something that's damaging and harmful, I'm going to call him out for it and I'm going to try to hold him accountable. If he does something that I think is good, then I'm going to give him credit for it. Like, I'm not trying to create any sort of narrative, uh, either Joe Biden good or bad. As a leftist, I think that you all know where I stand. Joe Biden has an extensive record that is extremely problematic and conservative. So overall, he doesn't get a honeymoon. You know, I don't give him this grace period where, you know, for the first couple of weeks, you know, something that he does, I just brush it off as well. He's learning. No, he knows what he's doing. But when it comes to uh, these executive orders that he is reportedly planning, I think these are good. Uh, you know, I've got to give him credit for this. And these are things that most reasonable people will be in favor of. So as Michael Shear and Peter Baker of the New York Times reports, on his first day in office alone, Mr. Biden intends a flurry of executive orders that will be partly substantive and partly symbolic. They include rescinding the travel ban on several predominantly Muslim countries, rejoining the Paris Climate Change Accord, extending pandemic-related limits on evictions and student loan repayments, issuing a mask mandate for federal property and interstate travel, and ordering agencies to figure out how to reunite children separated from families after crossing the border, according to a memo circulated on Saturday by Ron Klain, his incoming White House chief of staff, and obtained by the New York Times. The blueprint of executive action comes after Mr. Biden announced that he will push Congress to pass a $1.9 trillion package of economic stimulus and pandemic relief, signaling a willingness to be aggressive on policy issues and confronting Republicans from the start to take their lead from him. He also plans to send sweeping immigration legislation on his first day in office, providing a pathway to citizenship for 11 million people in the country illegally, along with his promise to vaccinate 100 million Americans for the coronavirus in his first 100 days. It is an expansive set of priorities for a new president that could be a defining test of his deal-making abilities and command of the federal government. Now, when it comes to him saying he's going to vaccinate 100 million Americans within the first 100 days, if he is actually a able to accomplish this, which currently it seems like a logistical nightmare, um, he really does get credit for that. When it comes to, uh, you know, rescinding the most horrible things that Trump did, even symbolic things such as the Muslim man, because right now, you know, it's very difficult to travel globally um, because of coronavirus. But these are all things that are really important and meaningful. And I expected this, like I expected him to get us back into the Paris Climate Accord because this was one of the signature achievements of the Obama era. And this isn't good. Like, just the Paris Climate Accord alone isn't good, but it's still better than nothing. It's it's better than nothing. It is meaningful. It does make a difference. Um, it, it, Just to have a president that actually believes in anthropogenic climate change in and of itself, I think that is important. It is meaningful given that we don't have much time left to act on climate change. So wherever there is a victory, I'm going to take it, even if it might not necessarily be enough. But things like, you know, mask mandates federally, you know, you can't impose a federal mask mandate 
Uh, but what he can do is make sure that if you're on federal property, you are required to wear a mask. Interstate travel, that's also important. So these are things that I think will make a huge difference in the short term, in the short term. And that's important. Like you have to take meaningful action to make sure that long term we are in a better place. But on your first day, I do expect you to focus on the short term. And these are easy things that he can accomplish when it comes to student loan debt cancellation. I don't know what he's going to do. There is some pressure from members of Congress, including Chuck Schumer, uh, to cancel at least $50,000 worth of student debt. We'll wait and see. It seems like Joe Biden is reluctant to do that. Uh, but these are great things, and, and I'm in favor of it. And that's not all. Uh, to the chagrin of Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, he also will be killing off the Keystone XL pipeline. And as Jake Johnson of Common Dreams reports, President-elect Joe Biden is reportedly planning on the day of his inauguration to rescind a federal permit allowing construction of the Keystone XL pipeline in the United States, a move environmentalists said would represent an immense victory for the planet attributable to years of tireless indigenous-led opposition to the Dirty Energy Project. CBC News reported Sunday that the words rescind Keystone XL pipeline permit appear on a list of executive actions supposedly scheduled for day one of Biden's presidency, which begins with his swearing in on Wednesday. The withdrawal of the Keystone XL permit is among several environment-related actions Biden plans to take via executive order during his first day in office, a list that includes rejoining the Paris Climate Accord. Now look, it's easy to give Biden credit for this, but you also have to give credit to the indigenous groups who never let their foot off the gas, who applied continuous pressure on both the Canadian and U.S. governments to kill this project off. So this is good. Like, I'm going to take a victory wherever I can get a victory. Times are dark right now, and so long as we're moving in the right direction, no matter how large of a step that we take, I think currently... I'm looking for anything, and this is all really encouraging to me. Having said all of that, though, Biden gets credit if he does, in fact, uh, do all of this. But one area where we can't let him off the hook for is the lie that he uh, peddled about stimulus checks. We were told many times that if Democrats retook the Senate, we get $2,000 checks. All you've got to do is vote for Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff, give us the Senate, and, ex and in exchange for that, we will give you $2,000 checks. Uh, well, now he's backtracking on that. Rather than giving us $2,000 checks, now we're being promised $1,400 checks. Because if you uh, subtract the $600 that we already received uh, from the $2,000, then we get $1,400. And $1,400 plus $600 equals $2,000. Except that's not what you said, though. That's not what you said. This is a literal mailer that Raphael Warnock's campaign sent out with a fake $2,000 check. This doesn't say $1,400. It says $2,000. And as Rebecca Bitten puts it, no matter how you rationalize this, it was a bait and switch. Using a visual device to motivate voters was effective. Backtracking and changing the amount on the check is a betrayal. And she's absolutely right. Like, you can't just do that and then immediately go back on that promise. Like, of course, you get credit for the other good things that you're doing, but what kind of bullshit is this? Where you tell us $2,000 checks are coming, we just got to give Democrats the Senate, and then you get the Senate back, and now suddenly you say, no, 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 it's going to be $1,400. Look, it should have been $2,000 per month. So the fact that all we're asking for in this instance is a one-time check of $2,000, I think that's pretty reasonable. Look at other countries. Canada, the UK, they have given their residents more. We haven't gotten the relief necessary. And going forward, I hope that Biden actually sees to it that there is a continued uh, relief effort, and not just like this one-time check or payment every couple of months. Uh, but this is not okay, and I'm glad that members of the squad are actually holding his feet to the fire. AOC spoke to the Washington Post, and she also is against this 180 from the Biden administration, saying $2,000 means $2,000. $2,000 does not mean $1,400. And she's absolutely right. If you are out of the gate, going back on a major promise, something that will drastically improve people's lives in the short term, like, you're setting yourself up for failure. So on one hand, the things that he's doing that are good, the federal mask mandate, you know, uh, basically, I also expect him to reinstate DACA as well, uh, prioritizing immigration reform, a huge $1.9 trillion relief package. I mean, the devil is in the details, but these are positive things. But you can't just like 
dangle $2,000 in front of people as a motivator and then immediately go back on that promise because going forward in future elections, the midterm coming up in 2022, how do you expect people to believe you? So look, ultimately, I've said this once, I'll say it again, Joe Biden and Democrats, they've got to deliver. When you control the totality of government, all eyes are on you. Well, except for the Supreme Court, but all eyes are on you. So if something goes wrong, you're going to be held accountable. So, you know, it seems as if going into this, being sworn in and on day one planning a lot of things, that is that is a good sign. It tells me that at least for now, he knows there's a lot of crises going on simultaneously that he has to address immediately. But at the same time, by rescinding you know, this promise, going back on the $2,000 check promise, that tells me that you still don't fully get it. You still are going to be um, out of touch with the needs of people. So look, it, it's it's one thing to, you know, do all of these good things. He gets credit for that. But this is seriously, like, this pisses me the fuck off with the $2,000 check thing. Like, I, I think that everyone is reasonable for expecting $2,000. It's not like we're stupid and naive for thinking, oh, well, of course, by saying we get a $2,000 check, he meant we get a $1,400 check because we already got $600. Like, nobody thought that. No reasonable person thought that. So, you know, we hold him accountable for that and then praise him when he does things that are good. This is the way that I intend to react to the Biden administration. But overall, you know, if I could make a prediction, I think I'm largely going to be dissatisfied with Joe Biden's administration because he isn't as progressive as anyone needs him to be currently. In fact, he's not progressive at all. Um, but having said that, though, will he be better than Donald Trump? Yeah, I fully expect him to be better than Donald Trump, but the bar is pretty fucking low if we're talking about Donald Trump um, and any Republican, given how far to the right they've shifted. But, you know, having said that, though, this is what we can expect from uh, the first day of Joe Biden's administration. And it looks good, just like don't go back on promises like the $2,000 check. As Joe Biden becomes the president of the United States, the term change on the outside, continuity on the inside does in fact come to mind. And I'm not trying to like perpetuate this false equivalence between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party because there are meaningful differences. There is differences when it comes to the rhetoric that they use that does in fact influence culture. You know, there are differences when it comes to voter suppression and what have you. But when it comes to neoliberalism, you know, finding market-based solutions for uh, issues that plague American society, foreign policy, these things don't necessarily change. And where there is change, where there is a difference, it's not signif significant enough. So while I fully expect Joe Biden to reduce drones. You know, we had Obama increase the number of drones when he took office, and then he scaled them back, and then Trump scaled them back up. I do expect Biden to reduce them to Obama era levels, you know, towards the end of Obama's administration, but I don't expect Joe Biden to end drone use altogether. I don't expect Joe Biden to reign in U.S. imperialism. Like, some things never change in government, and that's because our institutions have been corrupted by the virus known as capitalism. Uh, but I want to talk about some things that folks have to pay attention to within the Biden administration, and this is corruption. Like, of course, Donald Trump is one of the most overtly corrupt presidents in U.S. history, but corruption that we see when it comes to individuals getting government jobs after coming straight from the industry, like regulating industries that they came from, this is something that we cannot normalize. And just because it's a common phenomenon doesn't mean that we should accept it. So Joe Biden's defense secretary pick is a literal shill for the military industrial complex. He came from the defense industry and he will now be Joe Biden's defense secretary if approved. This is something that we can't accept. So as Rebecca Keel of The Hill reports, President-elect Joe Biden's choice to be Defense Secretary, retired General Lloyd Austin, stands to make up to $1.7 million when he leaves the board of defense contractor Raytheon Technologies Corp. if he's confirmed according to his financial disclosure forms. The disclosures released Sunday do not give an exact value of Austin's stock holdings related to his position on the Raytheon Board of Directors, but place the range from $800,000 to about 
about $1.75 million. In ethics forms, Austin pledged to fully divest from Raytheon within 90 days of being confirmed, as well as to recuse himself from decisions involving the company for a year unless a Pentagon ethics official determines the need for his participation outweighs the perception of a conflict of interest. It's not uncommon for defense secretaries to have ties to contractors. Three of the people who led the Pentagon in the Trump administration had defense contractor connections. Former Secretary James Mattis was on the board at General Dynamics. Former Secretary Mark Esper was Raytheon's top lobbyist. And former Acting Secretary Patrick Shanahan was an executive at Boeing. So this is just outrageous. Like anyone who cares about corruption and money in politics and the swamp... Republican or Democrat should care about this, should be outraged by this. Now, certainly, I will say that legally it is important that he severs ties with Raytheon. But having said that, though, what's going to stop him from going back to Raytheon once he's out of a job in government? It's just troubling because it still incentivizes bad behavior. And to be clear, when I say bad behavior, I mean warmongering, saber rattling, because all of this is good for the business known as war, which is, of course, a business in our late-stage capitalist system. But it's not just Austin who is a shill for the military-industrial complex. There are others in Biden's administration who have lots of conflicts of interests, and they were financially benefiting from industries that they will be overseeing, Janet Yellen and uh, Anthony Blinken. And this is pointed out in, I think, a brilliant article by the Daily Poster. And none of this is surprising, but it's still infuriating. It's titled, Biden's Revolving Door. And Andrew Perez, Walker Bragman, and Julia Rock explain how there are direct conflicts of interest with some of Biden's nominees. And this just isn't being talked about by folks in the mainstream media. So they report when President-elect Joe Biden's Treasury Secretary nominee Janet Yellen disclosed that she accepted big speaking fees from major corporations and industry groups, many liberal pundits quickly defended her and suggested the revelations are not newsworthy. However, the Daily Poster has found that many of those same companies and groups have been lobbying the agency Yellen has been selected to run. Anthony Blinken, Biden's pick for Secretary of State, has been consulting for giant companies with interests before his new department as well. Many of the financial firms, banks, and industry groups paying Yellen will have business before her treasury department. Investment bank Citigroup paid Yellen a combined $1.1 million for six speeches between March of 2019 and October of 2020. The company lobbied the treasury department this year on COVID relief, financial form rules, housing finance reform, cybersecurity legislation, and anti-money laundering legislation. Goldman Sachs, which paid Yellen more than $67,000 for a speech in June, reported lobbying Congress and Treasury this year on implementation of Democrats' 2010 Dodd-Frank Wall Street reform law and issues related to capital and resolution. As for Blinken, Biden's Secretary of State designate disclosed his clients as the secretive consulting firm West Exec Advisors. Biden's nominee for Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, reported that she was paid $180,000 by controversial data mining company and U.S. intelligence contractor Palantir. According to a Daily Post review, Blinken advised seven companies that have recently lobbied the State Department, including aerospace manufacturer Boeing and Blackstone Group, the world's largest private equity firm, social media giant Facebook, and pharmaceutical company Gilead. Boeing is one of the country's largest defense contractors, relying on the U.S. government for a substantial portion of its revenue. The State Department helps Boeing sell commercial planes overseas, and it also approves foreign arms deals by companies like Boeing. So ask yourself this, knowing that there are all of these conflicts of interest, do you honestly believe that these individuals are going to be impartial when they serve in these roles within Biden's administration? You'd have to be naive to think so. But this is such a common occurrence that it's not talked about in mainstream media. And when it is, you know, mainstream media pundits will literally defend these individuals. Janet Yellen was defended by the mainstream media, MSNBC. Um, and on top of that, like even some progressive organizations like the I think it was the PCCC, they were pleased and praised Biden for appointing Janet Yellen to be Treasury Secretary. So, I mean, like the bar is so low in America that out of all of the folks in D.C., like the least corrupted individual is worthy of praise, apparently. Now, maybe there are less corrupt people 
than Janet Yellen uh, for this position. In fact, I'm certain that there are. But we we become so accustomed to corruption and legalized bribery in America because we live in a late stage capitalist society where literally every single thing has become commodified. It's become an industry. Politics, elections have become commodified. War is a money-making industry. And when you have this marriage between industry and government, that is precisely when democracy fails. That's exactly why we're seeing such a low approval rating for Congress. So many policies that are very popular not get passed, such as Medicare for All, you know, federal marijuana legalization. It's because, you know, whatever the private interests want, that's what we often see become law. And that's not just me saying that. Like, as a political commentator, I think this is obvious, but this is backed up by political science studies. In fact, Dr. Gillens and Page in a 2014 Princeton University study found when it comes to policy outcomes, special interests and elites, they dictate what becomes law, whereas average citizens, like we have a statistically insignificant impact on policy outcomes. Like that tells you that we are in a late stage capitalist society, which makes democracy like almost impossible to thrive here. So, you know, if Biden is going to be a successful president, he's going to have to curtail the corruption that we see in D.C. But the question is, why would he do that when he is incentivized to keep this system going? This same system that we need him to, you know, change is what helped him get elected. Health insurance industry insiders donated to Joe Biden. They held fundraisers for him. So do we expect him to rein in the health insurance industry? Do we expect him to take on the very system that helped him get elected? And the answer, I think, is no. So, you know, I want folks to understand that this is not something that should be normalized just because it is a common phenomenon. That doesn't necessarily mean that we should get desensitized to it. We should still see this and be outraged to it. This is corruption. These conflicts of interest are completely unacceptable. And it's why we have to completely eradicate money in politics and decommodify elections. Otherwise, capitalism is going to kill everything about our society, including democracy itself. I'm mostly speaking to, you know, my liberal brothers and sisters here that you all understand that now is not the time to go to brunch. Now is the time to be motivated. Now is not the time to praise Joe Biden because things feel normal again. Now is the time to truly push for change because if we don't, then guess what's going to happen? We're going to see another demagogue emerge that may be worse than Donald Trump. And the writing's been on the wall for quite some time, so you can't, like, act surprised if this does happen again. You've been warned, so please, don't go to sleep during these years. Actually pay attention and fight with leftists and organizers and activists who have been fighting this capitalist system that is ruthless for decades now. So it's been a little more than a week since Donald Trump has been banned from Twitter and other social media platforms, and we're learning about the impact that this has had on the aggregate discourse with regard to the U.S. election, and it's honestly stunning, like shocking. I expected, you know, his ban from Twitter and social media to have a positive impact with regard to vitriol and hate and white supremacy and the spread of misinformation, but I didn't expect results to this extent. Um, this is... According to a study by Zignal Labs, misinformation specifically about the U.S. election fell by, get this, 73%, just by Donald Trump alone being banned. I did not expect the numbers to be this high because there are other actors and entities that spread misinformation at the behest of Donald Trump, far-right news outlets like Newsmax and OAN. But what this tells us is that Donald Trump was the most significant disseminator of propaganda and misinformation, at least when it comes to the election. And that is honestly astonishing. So according to Shona Ghosh of Business Insider, online misinformation about the U.S. election fell by as much as 73 percent in the week after President Trump was booted from Twitter and other social media sites. According to findings by Zignal Labs, conversations about election fraud fell from 2.5 million mentions to 688,000 mentions across several social media sites. The research house looked at conversations that spanned fraud, hacked machines, 
tampered ballots, and other conspiracies. The data indicates that tech platforms' ability to restrict the spread of falsehoods is an effective approach to containing misinformation online. Signal monitored social media sites for misinformation during the seven days from January 9th. The U.S. Capitol riots took place January 6th. Signal found that hashtags relating to the Capitol riots fell dramatically during the week after the suspensions. Mentions of the hashtags fight for Trump, hold the line, and the phrase march for Trump all fell around 95%. QAnon-specific hashtags also fell the week after Trump was suspended from Twitter, though mentions of the conspiracy and its supposed figurehead Q went up. So this is absolutely fascinating. We're not going to talk about the merits of Trump's ban, whether or not it was a good thing, because I addressed that in a separate video. But the fact that he was responsible for spreading that much misinformation single-handedly, it really goes to show you how important it is that we have leaders in power that actually are committed to the truth. And Donald Trump, I mean, whenever he would go on Twitter, he would complain about misinformation, or he would spread misinformation and complain about the election. And, you know, before he was banned, if you look at his timeline, like, tweet after tweet after tweet was labeled by Twitter that, you know, this was uh, not verified, or election data analysts say that this is incorrect. It was astonishing. Like, the amount of misinformation that he was spreading was shocking, even for Donald Trump, even by his standards. And throughout the course of his presidency, you know, these last four years, he has told more than 30,000 lies. 30,000 lies. So, you know, altogether, when, when you see the impact that the president has on political discourse in the United States, it kind of makes you feel like you're going crazy. Like, it feels like you're being gaslit. Like, it feels like we're in this post-factual era where anything that somebody says, it can be true so long as we believe it, even if it isn't grounded in empirical reality. And that's really frustrating because going forward, like as a country, how do we, how do we communicate with one another if we don't even agree on basic facts? Like the fact that COVID-19 is a thing. It's not a hoax, that it's actually a thing. Or the fact that the election was not stolen from Donald Trump. There's zero evidence that that is in fact the case. Widespread voter fraud is not a thing. So if we can't even establish like a basis of the reality, you know, facts about the reality that we live in, I just, I don't know how going forward we, we can be united ever. But this shows you that it really makes a difference what the president says. Like, his bully pulpit is very, very important and impactful. And what he says makes a substantial difference because if your ban leads to a 73% decrease in misinformation about the election, that shows that you were doing a lot of damage to the country. A lot of damage. And for the spread of misinformation, according to this one study, to fall by that much, I kind of feel optimistic that maybe in the post-Trump era, assuming that he won't be influential or as influential as he is now, which, uh, of course, he won't be. Um, you know, I'm hoping that folks who were part of the Donald Trump cult will come back to reality. I'm hoping that they, you know, won't be as easily misled. And even if there's going to be disagreement with me and these MAGA chuds who are part of the Trump cult or you and these MAGA chuds, at a minimum, like all that we can hope for and should hope for, is that when it comes to reality, we all agree on certain things, right? We can disagree on tax policy, healthcare policy, and I'll argue because I believe in my position. But if we don't even agree that certain things are real, like a global pandemic, which is not controversial in other countries, or that the election was stolen, like if, if we can't agree on like these very basic things and facts aren't persuading people, I just... I can't see how that society survives, but this tells me that maybe we have a chance with Trump being out. I mean, certainly we've got a lot of work to do, but at least when it comes to misinformation and snapping these folks who are part of that cult out of reality, getting them back into the real world, maybe maybe we can start the process of deprogramming them. I think that most of them can be brought back to reality. It'll take time. But some of them are too far gone, and we're going to have to reckon with that. Uh, but, you know, this this is just honestly shocking to me. Like, I, I was flabbergasted when I read this. 73%. 
Trump really was harmful to, you know, American political discourse. And that's just from like the public side, like what he did when it comes to policies, it perhaps was arguably even more damage. But this, I mean, wow, this is definitely, definitely interesting. Well, it's official. Joe Biden is now the 46th president of the United States. Donald Trump is out of office. And if I could get a live feed of Donald Trump right now and what he's doing, I would pay any amount for that. I would give an arm and a leg for that because that would be very entertaining. In fact, more so than the inauguration itself. Um, because Donald Trump, you know he's mad and the way that he left was to uh, the song YMCA, which didn't necessarily seem fitting for the occasion. Like he probably should have played something more emo, maybe Linkin Park, uh, because we know that he's really butthurt right now because he wanted to win and he wanted to win so bad he literally tried to destroy democracy to remain in power. But, I mean, that's all behind us now. The Trump era is officially over and Joseph R. Biden is the president. And I want to just take a moment to kind of talk about all of that because this really is important. Um, you know, for me, I am not excited about Joe Biden. I feel like if you are excited that Donald Trump is out of office... That's great. Take this time to celebrate. It's a pretty dark time in American history and human history. So if seeing him sworn in gives you joy, then genuinely don't like take that away from yourself. I, like if you're a Bernie Sanders supporter like me, you know, we all know what to expect with Joe Biden. This is not going to usher in some new era of progressivism in American politics. He's not going to be the next FDR and he's not up to the challenge, quite frankly. But just seeing Donald Trump out of office, after especially last year, he became even more brazenly authoritarian, arresting folks in Portland, Oregon, throwing them in unmarked vehicles, threatening to use the Insurrection Act. It is nice to see someone, you know, um, be booted out of office. And I will say that Kamala Harris being the first female president, that really is significant, you know, she is not someone who I like. Her politics don't match mine at all. She is a neoliberal, which means she supports free market capitalist solutions to political problems. You know, I don't like Kamala Harris, but I'm not going to deny the importance of the symbolism there. Like the fact that we have a female vice president who is a black woman. This this really is, I think, it is important. It is important for young girls to see a woman in power, right? Um, but putting all of that aside, what we need from these next couple of years are tangibles. We need policy concessions. We need Joe Biden to deliver. We need the Democratic Party to deliver because guess what? All eyes are on them now. They have 100% of the blame if things don't go well in this country. And trust me, Republicans are very disciplined in their messaging so they're going to be blamed no matter what. So what Democrats have to do is prove to the American people that they are delivering for them. Cut through the propaganda, cut through the bullshit, and the way that you can do this easily is to give people $2,000 checks, make sure they have health care, make sure that during this pandemic they're taken care of. And what's really important, I think, for this next year, and the way that I would measure Joe Biden as having a successful first year is if he is able to get COVID-19 under control. And that's something that's relatively difficult to do, given that we're at a state where we're seeing like 4,000 deaths per day. We're going to surpass 500,000 deaths probably in a month or so. Like, it's really serious. So if he can actually follow through on that promise of getting 100 million people vaccinated in the first 100 days, I think that is... That's huge. That's really, really substantial and praiseworthy. And I will praise him and give him credit for that if he can actually accomplish this. But I am skeptical because logistically speaking, that seems really difficult to do given how poor shape we're in currently. But if Joe Biden, at a minimum, can get COVID-19 under control and do a better job than Donald Trump, which I suspect he will, then I think, uh, you know, already by that standard alone, he'll be better than Donald Trump. And it's not a very high bar to pass. Donald Trump was a terrible president. I don't think he's as bad as George W. Bush was in terms of the damage that he caused. But if we were to give him another term, I think we would have plausibly seen him actually strike Iran, like see damage on the scale that George W. Bush caused 
internationally and certainly domestically, you know, with his incompetence, Joe Biden or Donald Trump, rather, he has a lot of blood on his hands and he's going to have to live with that for the rest of his life. But I don't think he's ever going to come to terms with that. So the best that we can hope for now in this new era, this Biden era, is that, you know, folks don't take this as a sign that things have returned to normal because a country that allows the rise of a demagogue, that's not normal circumstances. There were underlying material conditions and racism that was never eradicated and white supremacy, all of which led to Donald Trump. So if we genuinely want to stop the rise of the next Donald Trump, whoever that may be, we have to make sure that Joe Biden and the Democratic Party are held accountable for everything that they do. They actually take meaningful steps to change the, the material conditions in this country. Now, even if they're successful and, you know, it's the best case scenario and they actually really do improve the standard of living for everyone, that doesn't mean that, you know, the possibility of the next Trump coming to power is in entirely eliminated because, you know, if you give people money and they have jobs and they're not impoverished and desperate, that doesn't necessarily mean that racism and white supremacy vanishes like that. That's a separate issue that we have to tackle, right? But I mean, class and race issues, they are interconnected. And, you know, if we don't address these issues in the next four years, then I do worry that the next demagogue who comes along is going to be more effective and more nefarious than Donald Trump. You know, Donald Trump, the things that he wanted to accomplish, he was unable to accomplish because he doesn't really know what he's doing. As president, he was in over his head. But someone who actually knows how to wield power appropriately, they can do a lot more damage than Donald Trump. And I fear that that's going to happen if Democrats fail here. So the task ahead of them is absolutely gigantic. And, you know, my expectations for the Democratic Party are low because they've let me down time and again. But what we should want from them, like what we should get, our expectations should be high, even if, you know, we don't expect them to do a lot. But we'll have to wait and see. Like, I genuinely hope that Joe Biden proves me wrong, right? I've been very hard on Joe Biden. I've been relentless in attacking him. And part of that is because I'm just kind of a bitter bitch. I wanted Bernie Sanders to be president. I have no problem admitting that. But now, Joe Biden is president. Like it or not, that's the reality. So I hope that he actually proves me wrong and delivers. But we'll have to wait and see. And certainly, if he doesn't, I'm going to hold him accountable. But if he does something good that warrants praise, then I will absolutely give him credit. Again, I've said this once, I'll say it again. I don't want to establish like a narrative on this channel that either Joe Biden good, Joe Biden bad. I want to be objective. I want to be impartial. And so as a leftist, if Joe Biden does something that I agree with, I'm going to give him credit for that. And th that's the way that I think that political commentators should, you know, respond to the Biden administration going forward. Even though I hated Donald Trump, I did give him credit where it was do. I think that his criminal justice reform, the First Step Act, was a step in the right direction, albeit a small one. I think that him attempting to make peace with North Korea, even if that was frowned upon by, you know, mainstream media and the elite class, I think that was good. Anyone pursuing peace, even if they don't necessarily know how to facilitate that, they get credit for that. Even if you're Donald Trump, even if the rest of your administration is doing harm and damage. Um, so having said that, though, yeah, we have a new president. It's Joe Biden. And look, I'll just say I am I am a little bit relieved that Trump is out of power. Like there was a moment in time after the election where I was genuinely concerned that Trump maybe would be successful at somehow stealing it. I mean, we saw back in 2000 the way that George W. Bush kind of stole that election from Al Gore. But this time there were just too many states. You know, uh, it was it was too difficult for him to pull this off. He wasn't competent to pull this off. Um, so, yeah, now we go forward and um, do everything in our power to make the best of the situation that we're in and hope that we uh, at least at a minimum can expect that Joe Biden will handle this pandemic better and more competently. And I think that we can at least expect that. But of course, he's got to do more than just that. Structural changes need to happen 
if we want to prevent the rise of another Donald Trump. But uh, I'll leave that there because at this point, I feel like I'm just ram rambling. I just wanted to share my thoughts on Biden being sworn in because overall, like, you know, I feel not much. I kind of feel numb, not in a bad way or a good way. I just kind of feel ambivalent because, you know, sure, I'm relieved that Trump is out of office. But Biden, you know, he is someone who I think, even though there will be a lot of net positives with him being in office, there's going to be some downsides to it as well. So we'll have to deal with that on a case-by-case -case basis. But for now, at least Trump's out of office. That's uh, that's a good thing. That in and of itself, I think, is worthy of celebration, even if the person who's replacing him is not my first choice or second choice or 18th choice, if we're being serious. So I have watched way too many hours of interviews with Donald Trump supporters who genuinely believed that he was going to be the next president. And this is like from a week or two weeks ago, you know, after the Electoral College made it official, after Congress had already certified the results, you know, all that's left was Biden's inauguration. And up until that point, there were still Donald Trump supporters, uh, namely QAnon supporters who actually believed that Trump was going to be sworn in for a second term. And they look for little subtle things that they believed was a nod from Donald Trump. So Trump would say, you know, there will be a new administration. He said this in one of his videos, uh, but he didn't say Biden's name. So since he didn't acknowledge Biden, then perhaps he's referring to a new Trump administration. Trump too, if you will. And, you know, the thought in the back of my mind as I heard them deny reality was, what are they actually going to say and do once Joe Biden is sworn in and you can't deny it any longer. Uh, and a lot of QAnon supporters believed that on Inauguration Day, Joe Biden wouldn't be sworn in. Rather, Trump would uh, impose martial law and Joe Biden would be arrested. I think I'm oversimplifying what they believe was going to happen, but that's kind of the gist of it. Um, and according to uh, what they're saying now, their reactions are pretty interesting. There's still some folks who are denying that Joe Biden is president or that this is all part of Trump's plan now that he's sworn in. But I am a little bit relieved to see some of them kind of get the reality check that they really desperately needed. So I want to share some of the comments from QAnon conspiracy theorists who are really shocked right now. This person says, well, I'm the official laughing stock of my family now. Awesome. <laughs> I mean, you kind of deserve it. Uh, this is an embarrassment. Here come all the excuses now. Uh, this person says, Q also said noon. I will start kicking people for their attitudes. We are patriots. You stand here and hold the line with us or you can leave your choice. So this one is a true Kool-Aid drinker um, and doesn't want to admit uh, the reality. Uh, this individual named Sophie shared this from the QAnon casualties subreddit. Uh, a Q mom was working herself into a heart attack. This is shocking to me. Her and her cronies are in such a tizzy waiting for the National Guard to come out and arrest Biden as soon as he takes the stage that she's literally having chest pain. Holy shit. <laughs> I can't say that I'm even concerned at this point. Wow. To be that committed and detached from reality is just... I don't even know how to respond to that. Pepe Time says, fuck this sham. Uh, I want to puke. Uh, fuck praying we see some cry emojis um he sold us out it's revolution time trump lied and failed us simple as that um so i mean like i don't know if these folks think that donald trump was going to actually like arrest joe biden or that you know q was just wrong uh, or q was right but trump got cold feet but either way they think that trump sold them out which is interesting um you see one person laughing probably a troll um, and then this person says, we were lied to by Q, and now we have to figure out how to move on. This is what I want to see. I want to see them realize that they were misled and they were duped. Uh, this person says, I am sick to my stomach. Uh, we've been played, so what now? Sad and confused, sick to my stomach. Uh, this person says, where's the damn storm? What happened? Why didn't the plan work? I feel stupid. Very interesting. Uh, Trump fooled us. 
Worst day in American history. I'm sick to my stomach. I can't believe what is happening. Nothing to let out but disappointment. Um, Kaniala Ng shared some of these titles. Uh, not very popular, but they're from the QAnon Casualties subreddit. Can the military step in now? Mods, please explain why Biden isn't arrested yet. So what date do we wait for now? So, you know, there's a lot of folks based on this. I mean, this is a small sample size, obviously, but uh, they feel embarrassed and stupid. Some of them feel as if Donald Trump betrayed them. That's the reaction that reasonable people, people who aren't too far gone, would express when they realize that they've been duped. When you see evidence directly contradict what you believed, that's that's a good thing, right? But you see some folks who they are incapable of fighting past the cognitive dissonance. I'm not going to put this one up on the screen, but I'm going to read this, or some of it at least. So this person is uh, trying to rationalize why Biden was sworn in. Trump is now stepping down, not in the way that you think. He is allowing a smooth transition of power, not to Biden, but to the military. This is exactly what he means. Transition into martial law. So Biden isn't actually the president. This is a transition into martial law. And I don't think they realize what martial law is and why that would be bad for all of us. Uh, but this person continues, as predicted, General Flynn will be taking the reins here for a while. You didn't hear during POTUS speech anything about Biden or conceding. This is part of Nisera and Gasera as he has stepped down from the U.S. corporation dead entity into the new administration, 1776 Constitution Party. I don't think I have to go much further because this is going to uh, rot my brain if I read anymore and rot your brain as well. But some folks are still trying to believe that QAnon was correct and Trump is still fighting for them and Trump still has a plan. Trust the plan, guys. This, I mean, if you can't leave this, then this is really sad. I, I hope that most people react to this by thinking, wow, I was duped. It's time for me to move on. And, um, you know, the thing about this conspiracy theory is out of all the conspiracy theories that I've heard of, this is the dumbest one. It's not even like entertaining, like at least with Illuminati, uh, there's some intrigue there, right? It's interesting. Like there's this big cabal of celebrities and politicians that are devil worshipers, but this is more batshit insane but somehow less interesting. Like, it's fascinating from a sociological standpoint, and there are questions that I want people to answer for me, like about the psychology of these folks. Like, I want to know how you get roped into a conspiracy theory this dumb. But in terms of, like, the sheer entertainment value, QAnon is dog shit. Like, it all relies on Donald Trump, and he, of all people, is going to crack down on pedophilia and this satanic ring of like baby eating politicians. Donald Trump has been accused of rape and sexual assault how many times now? And he's the hero, he's your savior? It's just astonishing to me. So what I genuinely hope is for most of these folks, because I know not all of them are savable, I hope that they come to reality. Like the response should be, yeah, I feel embarrassed now. I was proven wrong. Now it's time for me to grapple with my mistake and grow as a human being. This is not like something that is abnormal. We all as human beings go through this at some point, maybe not to this level and at this scale, but we all find out that one of our beliefs was incorrect. It was wrong. And we staked a lot on it. Like for me growing up, I was indoctrinated into religion. I was an evangelical. And, you know, learning that that was all a lie and it was wrong and there's no evidence that God exists, it really is an eye-opening thing. And it really opens the door to you being more objective and impartial, I think, because you kind of question yourself once you fight past the cognitive dissonance. You think, well, since I was wrong about this, what else am I wrong about? And you kind of go on this philosophical journey, which I think is important for self-growth. So I hope that that happens with these folks. I genuinely hope that a lot of these people wake up and this is the reality check that they needed. But some of them are going to try to rationalize it and that's to be expected. Some of them are just too far gone. But if a lot of people leave the cult and they wake up, I'm going to applaud that. You know, welcome back to reality. We've missed you. But hopefully going forward, you know, you are a little bit more rigorous in, you know, the sources that you... uh consume in the media that you digest be a responsible consumer 
of what you perceive to be news. Like if you see it in a meme on Facebook, maybe before believing that, just do a quick fact check. If you hear it from some entity who is supposedly working for the government, but that individual pre presents like no evidence that that's the case, maybe question their motives, question whether or not more evidence is necessary. Let's just try to be more responsible and uh, have some common sense. That's literally all that I could ask and hope for. I want to take some time to talk about my man, Bernard Sanders, who, let me just say, at Joe Biden's inauguration looked like an absolute chad. Uh, this is kind of the energy that I'm feeling right now. He represents all of us. And I am confident that this image will be memed uh, for years to come, which is great because it's uh, it's fantastic. Um, but Bernie Sanders is an important individual, uh, not just because of the influence that he has and the platform that he has, uh, but because he is going to be the uh, Senate Budget Committee chairman, which is really important because he actually cares about the American people. And to care about the American people and simultaneously be in a position where you can affect change in a meaningful way, we haven't seen this in quite some time, and I'm really looking forward to it. So in an interview with ABC News, he had a message for Republicans, or rather he had a warning for Republicans that I'm really glad to see. Like, he needs to say this. Somebody needed to say this. But basically, simply put, he says to Republicans, look, we are going to give you the opportunity to work with us. But if you do not work with us, then we are going to steamroll you. Take a look. I have no problem with reaching out to Republicans. I would prefer to do it that way. But if we hear very early on that Republicans do not want to act in a way that meets the needs of working people in this country or the middle class, sorry, we're going to do it alone. Uh, the truth of the matter uh, is that Republicans use budget reconciliation over the years to provide massive tax breaks to the rich to try to repeal the Affordable Care Act. We're going to use it to protect the working families uh, and the middle class. That is exactly what I want to hear Chairman Sanders say. Because Republicans, they used reconciliation. They, they did everything in their power to accomplish what they wanted. You know, they, they approved a Supreme Court justice a week before the election. So it's time that Democrats actually play hardball. Now, look, I think it's reasonable that at first Joe Biden is coming in and saying we're going to we're going to try to pass things like, you know, another stimulus package with a 60 vote threshold. We're not going to opt for a reconciliation immediately. And that's what Bernie Sanders is saying, too, uh, because you're giving them a chance to try to work with you. However, if they shoot you down, if they slap down the olive branch that you are extending, waste no time, move right on without them, because then you can basically bludgeon them in the midterm elections. If you're Joe Biden, you could say, look, we tried to work with Republicans, but unfortunately, they didn't want to work with us. So alone, we had to pass a stimulus package along party lines. We're the ones who gave you uh, $1,000 or $2,000. We did X, Y, and Z for you. We're the ones who administered, you know, vaccines in a more competent manner, and they didn't help us. They were salty because Donald Trump lost the election. They refused to work with us, and so we had to do it alone. Like, use this and actually play politics. Now, I have no confidence that Joe Biden is going to want to play politics in that way because I think he, at his core, is pretty conservative. But Bernie Sanders, as budget committee chairman, he actually has a lot of influence. And so if he wants to pass something using reconciliation that's just, you know, 51 votes, he can do it. And his agenda is very ambitious, and you love to see it. So in an op-ed for CNN, he actually wrote about this uh, saying, amid so much economic suffering and despair, it is imperative that Democrats pass a bold and aggressive economic agenda within the first 100 days of Joe Biden's presidency. And as Warren Gunnels reports, that includes boost checks of $2,000, a $15 an hour minimum wage, emergency Medicare for all, double community health centers, lower drug prices, don't tax emergency unemployment benefits, paid family leave, universal health care, rebuild America, combat climate change, tax the rich, save USPS, and more. And again, this is all what Bernie Sanders wants to happen within the first 100 days. And he's saying, look, as budget committee chairman, we're in a position to where we can make this happen. I am going to allow votes uh, on things like this to pass. All we need is a simple majority, 50 plus one votes. Kamala would be the tiebreaker. 
So this is absolutely brilliant. When you have someone like Bernie Sanders in this position, there's no excuse for Democrats. There is no excuse for Democrats. So if they don't capitalize on this unique opportunity that they haven't had since, you know, the 2000s when Obama was first sworn in, then, you know, that's on them. If you fail, you can't blame Republicans here. You cannot blame Republicans. All eyes are on you. Accountability is going to be on your shoulders. So if you fail, you know, there's nobody to blame but yourselves. So I'm glad that Bernie Sanders is a... Uh, is uh, in this position. You know, I think it's smart. It's smart politics to basically say, look, we tried to allow Republicans to work with us and have some input. And now I don't want them to have input, realistically speaking. But if they shoot you down, I think that makes for a really good situation. It, you can use that politically to beat them in the midterm. So we'll see. I don't necessarily expect very savvy politics from corporate Democrats like Joe Biden or Kamala Harris. But I do think that Bernie Sanders is a little bit more strategic, and I think that he can push them in a better direction. And if we don't get all of this, then we better get at least half of this. Like, I think during a pandemic, we should expect more. We should ask and demand more from our government. Because if you can't, you know, uh, serve the American people when we need you the most, then you're really proving that you are useless. And your legitimacy will go down as a direct result. So, you know, look. We'll see. We'll wait and see. But I do feel a little bit more optimistic because Bernie Sanders is in that position. Of course, I would have preferred if he was uh, the president, but that's neither here nor there. He will be the budget committee chairman, and I fully expect him to, you know, utilize the power that he has to do as much as he possibly can to improve the lives of Americans. So I am really pleased to see Joe Biden take COVID-19 seriously. In fact, on his first day in office, you could argue that he already proved he's taking the virus more seriously than Donald Trump ever did. And he already rolled out his national strategy to contain the spread of the virus, which is really important. So I'm going to go through key provisions from his national strategy. I think that a lot of this is going to make a huge difference. The first thing that he wants to do is make sure that he fulfills his promise of getting 50 million people vaccinated within the first 100 days of his presidency. That means he's got to get out 100 million vaccines. So 50 million people get dose one and dose two. Logistically speaking, I don't know that this is realistic, but the fact that he's pushing to get this done in and of itself is, I think, important. Now, if you're wondering why it seemed as if we weren't making any progress with regard to the distribution of this vaccine is because Donald Trump wasn't doing anything. Like if it seemed as if he just stopped being president after he lost the election, You'd be correct, because as Common Dreams reports, Biden team says Trump vaccine distribution plan non-existent. There is nothing for us to rework, said one of President Biden's COVID advisors. We are going to have to build everything from scratch. Just think about this. Like, let that sink in. The last president did nothing to distribute the vaccine. Nothing. It was non-existent. Because Donald Trump refused to act... How many more thousands of people are going to die? How much more behind are we going to be? Like, I wouldn't have expected him to come up with a competent plan, but something that, you know, they can work with would have been nice, but it's just, it really goes to show you he checked out in that last couple of months. He didn't care about anything. He was just sulking. He was mad that he lost the election. And uh, this is absolutely shameful, but I'm glad now that we have an administration that's taking it seriously. I mean, love him or hate him. I don't ideologically align with Joe Biden on anything, basically. But the fact that he's taking this seriously, that does matter. That allows us to more quickly get back to normal or at least normal before the pandemic. If we can end this pandemic, we save lives. So this is priority number one to me. Uh, so let's go through some of the key proposals here. Besides his plan to distribute 100 million vaccinations, CNN reports President Joe Biden's first full day in office on Thursday focused on rolling out his national strategy to get the coronavirus pandemic under control and signing several executive actions, including ramping up vaccination supplies and requiring international travel 
travelers to provide proof of a negative COVID-19 test prior to traveling to the U.S. Now, additionally, he is utilizing the Defense Production Act to speed up production of testing kits, supplies for vaccinations, and also for personal protective equipment, which is really important. Uh, on top of that, he issued a federal mask mandate, which is as comprehensive as he can be with the power that he has as president. So this is definitely something that I think we needed a long time ago. And there is a lot more, like his plan is very comprehensive, so I can't possibly get to all of it. But I do want to at least go through all of the executive actions that he signed one by one, because when you step back and look at all of this, what it amounts to is, I think, a really solid start like out of the gate he very clearly is coming out swinging and i have to give him credit where it's due so when it comes to executive actions he signed one that accelerates manufacturing and delivery of supplies for vaccination testing and ppe that's the one that we just talked about uh directs fema to expand reimbursement to states to fully cover the cost for national guard personnel and emergency supplies establishes the pandemic testing board to expand u.s coronavirus testing capacity establishes a preclinical program to boost development of therapeutics in response to pandemic threats enhances the nation's collection production sharing and analysis of coronavirus data this is something that is crucial directs fema to create federally supported community vaccination centers directs the department of education and hhs to provide guidance for safely reopening and operating schools child care providers and institutions of higher education now we'll come back to this later because it's a lot more than just that. I think that it's important that there's federal guidance, but there's more on this that I want to touch on. Uh, calls on the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, to release clear guidance on COVID-19, decide whether to establish emergency temporary standards, and directs OSHA to enforce worker health and safety requirements, requires mask wearing in airports and on certain modes of transportation, including many trains, airplanes, maritime vessels, and intercity buses. International travelers must provide proof of a negative COVID-19 test prior to coming to the U.S. That's what we just talked about. Creates the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force to help ensure an equitable pandemic response and recovery. Also really important not to overlook this. I'm glad he's doing this. A presidential directive to restore America's leadership, support the international pandemic response effort, promote resilience for future threats, and advance global health security and the global health security agenda. Also, we'll talk about this in detail a little bit later. Launches a 100 days masking challenge, asking Americans to to wear masks for 100 days, requires masks and physical distancing in federal buildings, on federal lands, and by government contractors in urges states and local governments to do the same, stops the U.S. withdrawal from the World Health Organization with Dr. Anthony Fauci becoming the head of the delegation to the WHO, creates the position of COVID-19 response coordinator, reporting directly to Biden and managing efforts to produce and distribute vaccines and medical equipment. Now, when it comes to us rejoining the World Health Organization, I think this is obviously a no-brainer. You don't leave the World Health Organization during a pandemic unless you're a complete clown. But one of the concerns, globally speaking, was that richer countries would jump to the front of the line once a vaccine is available. And what he's doing is making sure that developing countries and poor countries actually get access to the vaccine as well. Because look, if rich countries get the vaccine first, but all of these poor countries are left behind, Globally speaking, that's not really going to do much to contain the spread of the virus, because if we want to get a pandemic under control, which is contagious, you have to make sure that everyone is cured, everyone is vaccinated, so you can't just have this approach where, you know, the rich countries and developed countries get access to it, but, you know, third world countries don't. Like, that. that's something that's unacceptable if we're realistic and actually want to contain the spread of it. So him doing this, very important. You have to have a global effort to get this under control because this is a human issue, not just the U.S. issue. Now, as for the executive order related to schools, he is filling in a crucial gap of what was missing with the Trump administration. I mean, there was just no federal guidelines on how to safely reopen schools. So this was managed on a state by state, city by city basis. And, you know, when you have some states that don't take it seriously, this creates an unequal reopening effort in the aggregate. So by him suggesting that we have federal standards to reopen schools, that is really important. But what I disagree with, vehemently so, is his plan, his push rather, to reopen schools within 100 days. Like even in the best case scenario, let's say that he is successful and he gets 50 million Americans vaccinated and one sixth approximately of the population is now immune. Even in that instance, 
how can you say that that's enough to safely reopen schools? I mean, by then, we'll have to see how many cases we're having per day, what the positivity rate is. But you can't just arbitrarily say, I want to reopen all schools by 100 days, because that's not something that you can just do if you truly care about health and safety. Like, if cases are better by then and it's safe to reopen, then sure. But just having this goal to reopen schools within 100 days you could be undermining your own effort to keep people safe. So you have to prioritize safety and not just arbitrarily reopening schools. And what he should be planning for is to potentially have schools, uh, you know, operate remotely in the long term. So provide funding for that. Don't just like arbitrarily say, no, we've got to open all schools because then you just sound like Donald Trump and Republicans. Having said that, though, that's really the only area of criticism that I have for him. You know, of course, the next component of this is economic relief, which House Democrats are saying is supposed to come soon. But overall, the totality of the executive orders that he signed related to COVID-19, I think this is absolutely necessary. This is what we've been needing to see. There's been no leadership at the federal level when it comes to COVID-19, which is why you see some states doing really good and some states doing really bad. Now, currently, you know, we're in a third surge. Hopefully we're getting out of that as cases start to slightly decrease. But we have to have some leadership during a time like this. And it's important that he does this. Establish standards, roll out a national strategy. Just show us that you care. And this is important. So I am very pleased so far, like I'd imagine when we start getting into policy discussions, healthcare, I'm going to be furious with Joe Biden. But for now, uh, he's off to a great start, at least when it comes to tackling COVID-19. This is really good. And I'm uh, cautiously optimistic about this. So last year on the program, we talked about Joe Biden's proposal for net neutrality and municipal broadband, and it was surprisingly really strong. You know, for Joe Biden, someone who is overall mostly conservative and where he is progressive, he usually only supports incremental progressive reforms. You know, for net neutrality, he he has a great plan. Like, I have to give him credit where it's due. However, one of the responses to my video about Joe Biden's net neutrality proposal was skepticism. And I think rightfully so, because Joe Biden has ties to internet service providers who don't support net neutrality. I mean, they contribute to his campaign. He actually kicked off his 2020 campaign uh, with a lobbyist for Comcast holding a fundraiser for him. So when you see that, you've got to think, okay, is he even actually going to follow through once special interests get in his ear? But my pitch as to why I do believe Joe Biden as president can make a difference when it comes to net neutrality is because the president isn't necessarily involved with net neutrality. This comes down to who they appoint as FCC chair. Now, Donald Trump didn't even know what net neutrality was, literally. Like, he put out tweets talking about net neutrality and condemning it, but the way that he described it tells me that he had never even heard of it. So, Ajit Pai basically unilaterally in implemented his own agenda. So, for Joe Biden to actually carry out his vision, all he needs to do is appoint someone to be the FCC chair who actually saves net neutrality, restores net neutrality, and invests in municipal broadband, which would be a game changer. Now, this is what I said specifically, and I made the case for a very specific individual that I wanted Joe Biden to promote to FCC chair. Look at Jessica Rosenworcel as one of the options here. So she's currently an FCC commissioner, and all Joe Biden has to do is name her as Ajit Pai's replacement, which is something that isn't out of the realm of possibility. She's certainly someone who he'd consider. And she would actually do wonders. Now, I will say this, that Jessica Rosenworcel, who's a current FCC commissioner, she wasn't always the biggest ally to net neutrality. Because let me remind you, back in the Obama years, he appointed a Comcast lobbyist to be the FCC chair, Tom Wheeler. And he appointed Tom Wheeler after Tom Wheeler donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to him or fundraised hundreds of thousands of dollars for Barack Obama. So that appointment was the result of corruption. And one of the first things that Tom Wheeler tried to do was dismantle net neutrality by introducing fast lanes, which was a way of allowing internet service providers to carve out these types of packages, not necessarily explicitly in the way that, you know, Ajit Pai's rules would have allowed, but just by saying, hey, if you pay us more, we'll give you faster internet for this website. When that's not okay, that undermines net neutrality. 
But what happened was Tom Wheeler ended up becoming one of the biggest allies to the net neutrality movement ever, and he gave activists everything that they wanted because he succumbed to public pressure. They were protesting in front of his house, and the campaign that net neutrality activists mounted against him was highly successful, so much so that not only did he declare the internet a public utility, but he went even further than that and started to regulate zero rating, which basically allows cell phone carriers like Verizon to undermine net neutrality in a roundabout way using zero rating because they can say, hey, us at Verizon here, we have this brand new streaming service and if you use our streaming service, this isn't going to count towards your data. But if you use Netflix, that will count towards your data. So, I mean, this is anti-consumer. It's anti-competitive. It allows these types of, you know, cell phone providers and internet service providers to basically rig the rules in their favor and give themselves the advantage that other competitors don't have. So, Tom Wheeler started to, you know, hone his craft a little bit, really zero in uh, on these types of practices. And Jessica Rosenworcel was a part of the Obama administration. She was part of that Tom Wheeler era where they were aggressively trying to make the internet more free and open. So even if back in 2015, she kind of downplayed the importance of municipal broadband saying, oh, well, you know, this is something that I don't want to, you know, get people's hopes up about, but it seems kind of unlikely because it's difficult to do the infrastructure and whatnot and building it would be a hassle. Now things have changed. She wasn't an ally. But now she is. And if Joe Biden only did one thing with regard to net neutrality and made Jessica Rosenworcel the FCC chair and replaced Ajit Pai, he could fulfill all of the promises that he's saying now and then some because he's not actually the one that's doing it. It's Jessica Rosenworcel who we do actually trust to do what he's saying he wants to do. So that was in July of last year and I am pleased to announce that I got exactly what I wanted. The individual who I hoped Joe Biden would appoint. Like the best case scenario, that's what we got. This is phenomenal news. If you are an advocate uh, of net neutrality and if you want public municipal broadband, like this is cause for celebration. Now, as NBC News reports, President Joe Biden has picked Jessica Rosenworcel to run the Federal Communications Commission as its acting chair, making the 49-year-old lawyer and podcast host from West Hartford, Connecticut, the second woman to be appointed to that role in the commission's 96-year history. The job involves such daunting tasks as helping millions of Americans get reliable access to the internet. Rosenworcel first came to the FCC over 20 years ago in 1999 before leaving the agency to be congressional aide in 2007 as senior communications counsel for the Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation. In 2012, she returned to the FCC where she was appointed to be a commissioner under President Barack Obama. She was re-nominated in 2017 by President Donald Trump while the FCC was led by Chairman Ajit Pai during his historic undoing of the country's network neutrality protections. Now, as the president's choice to lead the agency, she's likely to pick up the network neutrality baton again, which prohibited internet service providers from charging websites to reach users at faster speeds. When Chairman Tom Wheeler ran the agency under Obama, Rosenworcel boldly pushed him to create more aggressive network neutrality rules, a stance he eventually adopted and led to the network neutrality protections that were passed in 2015. And when Pi came to lead the agency with the intention to take a weed whacker to net neutrality in 2017, she didn't sit quietly either. Quote, let's roar, let's make a ruckus, let's stop this plan in its tracks, she tweeted in 2017 when Pi released this plan to rescind the net neutrality rules. Over 22 million comments were submitted to the agency in response to the removal of the internet traffic rules. So this is absolutely fantastic news. If you are a supporter of net neutrality, and most people are, it doesn't matter if you are, you know, a socialist or a conservative or a liberal, it doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, this is a very, very popular thing. Uh, so if you are a proponent of net neutrality, this is definitely cause for celebration. Because Jessica Rosenworcel is basically one of, if not the best ally that we have in this fight. She has been a longtime proponent of net neutrality regulations. And uh, this means she's going to be in a position to undo Ajit Pai's 2017 repeal of net neutrality. Now, a court already basically shot down portions of it because in his repeal of net neutrality, there was a clause in it that allowed states, that allowed the FCC to block states from implementing their own net neutrality laws. And of course, courts threw that portion out. So we have some states, mostly populous states like New York and California, with net neutrality laws. And other states, red states primarily, 
without net neutrality protections. But she's going to restore that. And what's important is that she and Joe Biden are in favor of building up public municipal broadband. Now, we're going to go back and forth unless we actually pursue this path, because when it comes to net neutrality, it is the case that, sure, she can restore net neutrality again, but the next Republican administration can appoint an FCC chair that just undoes it again. So how do we get a long-term solution so we don't have to deal with this issue every couple of years? Well, we opt for public municipal broadband because the only reason why net neutrality is an issue is because we don't have a variety of ISPs. Like in your area, you probably have one or two if you're lucky. So if we have our own local municipal broadband service that we control, Net neutrality would be an irrelevant issue because if Comcast chooses to charge you more money to get access to certain websites or to get faster speeds to websites, that doesn't matter if you have your own ISP. If it's publicly owned municipal broadband, you control it. You do what you want. So we don't have to worry about this issue if we get that. And if Joe Biden funds infrastructure projects for municipal broadband, this really is a game changer. Jessica Rosenworcel being in this position is a game changer. So, you know, a lot of leftists, rightfully so, were frustrated to see Joe Biden sworn in. I'm not going to lie. I was salty as hell because I wanted Bernie Sanders to be the president. But this is a victory for us. This is a huge victory for us. The fact that he has chosen Jessica Rosenworcel, this is this is everything if you are a net neutrality proponent. So look, um, I'll take a win where I can get it. And this is a really huge victory for uh, advocates of freedom on the internet. On day one as president, expectedly, Joe Biden has already initiated the process to have the U.S. rejoin the Paris Climate Accord. And additionally, this even surprised me, but he tanked the Keystone XL pipeline, which I was not expecting because when you have the Canadian prime minister basically pushing for this pipeline, I would have expected Joe Biden to kind of have an easy out and think, well, you know, I'm working with our closest partner and our neighbor but he tanked it. So this is all great. It's a really big deal. The Paris Climate Accord is by no means like the end-all be-all, but I think that any step forward, any progress that we make, even if it's small, that is better than not making any progress, or in the case of Donald Trump, even going backwards, undoing what little progress we've made. So as Alexander C. Kaufman of HuffPost reports, hours after his inauguration Wednesday, President Joe Biden signed an executive order to rejoin the Paris Climate Agreement ending the United States' brief but symbolic exit from the global pact to slash planet heating emissions that virtually every nation has joined. So basically what happens is Joe Biden signed the executive order, which basically tells the UN that we intend to rejoin the Paris Climate Accord, and then it takes 30 days, and then once again we will formally be a signatory and a party to the Paris Climate Accord. It's that simple. So this is really good news, uh, but of course, since Republicans deny the reality of anthropogenic climate change, at least one of them took the time to shit on Joe Biden for this. Now, I'm all about dunking on Joe Biden, but when he does something good, I think he deserves credit. Now, if Ted Cruz saw that Joe Biden was giving tax cuts to the rich or starting a war or cutting Social Security, I'm sure then he'd praise Joe Biden. But when he does like the one good thing uh, with regard to climate change that we expect him to do, of course, now Ted Cruz has something to say. But before I tell you what Ted Cruz said about Joe Biden rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, uh, we're going to take a little bit of a detour because I think it's really funny to see the internet clowning on him and dunking on him because he put out some tweets about the inauguration ceremony and folks on both sides of the political spectrum were shitting on him and it was really great to see this is the kind of unity that i want to see where we all team up to collectively denounce and shit on ted cruz the clown who incited a violent insurrection just a couple of weeks ago let's not forget that but as for the tweets that we're talking about so he tweeted out a video of lady gaga performing the national anthem and also a video of j-lo performing and as you can see here by the comment to like ratio he got dogpiled on <laughs> and this was great so let's go through some of the comments here so this person says looks like the pizza gang is all here uh which is an implication that uh these are all pedophiles this is a reference to pizzagate 
uh, incredibly batshit insane. This person says, The devil worshippers are congregating together today. They are wanting their new world order to be brought in for their evil master. Very, very uh, sound and coherent. Uh, this person says, There's nothing beautiful about anything involving the overthrowing of our government. The election was stolen. Rigged election! Exclamation point. Uh, so this is one of those times where you have to go along to get along. And this person is very clearly not happy about Ted Cruz tweeting this out. So that's just like a little snapshot of the right-wingers who follow Ted Cruz, who were dunking on him. But you can also see a lot of lefties and even liberals dunking on him, saying that he should resign, calling him a piece of shit. And I, I just, like, this warms my heart to see people on the left and the right and on the center all shit on Ted Cruz. It's just really beautiful and it, it makes me feel, dare I say, patriotic. <laughs> An emotion that only Ted Cruz uh, can get people to feel uh, by our united hatred of him. But let's get to his tweet about the Paris Climate Accord because I assure you it is absolutely fucking idiotic. He tweeted out, By rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement, President Biden indicates he's more interested in the views of the citizens of Paris than in the jobs of the citizens of Pittsburgh. This agreement will do little to affect the climate and will harm the livelihoods of Americans. Now, he was so proud of this tweet that he actually doubled down on his personal account, which is the same account where he liked porn on, by the way, and he tweeted out, Who do you stand with? Paris or Pittsburgh? If you support blue-collar union workers, if you stand for jobs, get your free bumper sticker here. And then you have to sign up for his email list, where he will constantly solicit you for donations. Now, first of all, let me just say, the Republican Party is not the party of unions. Ted Cruz is not an individual who supports unions, because let me remind you that in 2013, he co-sponsored the Right to Work Act, which is literally a national union-busting bill. So anyone who supports this effort, the so-called Right to Work effort and the Right to Work Act, they are not a friend to unions. You support this legislation if you intend on busting up unions. Second of all, why is he using this Pittsburgh and Paris thing? Like, you're not from Pittsburgh, you're from Texas. And this doesn't just affect the citizens of Paris. Climate change impacts Everyone. It's a global issue. We all live in the same planet. So it's stupid, but he's so proud of it because, you know, Pittsburgh and Paris both start with a P. So, you know, it, it kind of just rolls off the tongue. This is idiotic. Uh, so, of course, folks dunked on him for this. Uh, but my favorite response is from actor and comedian Seth Rogen, who responded very simply by saying, Fuck off, you fascist. To which Ted Cruz responded saying, Charming, civil, educated response, Seth Rogen. If you're a rich, angry Hollywood celebrity, today's Democrats are the party for you. If you're a blue collar, if you're a union member, if you work in energy or manufacturing, not so much. Me. Now, again, he's trying to pretend as if he's pro-union. Motherfucker, you supported the Right to Work Act. You want to break up unions, not support them, not embolden them. So shut up about that. Second of all, if you are going to say that Seth Rogen is an elitist, that's fine. I'd agree with you. He's a multimillionaire. I'm sure that he lives in a mansion. However, if the implication is that he's an elitist, but you're not, that's bogus. You're worth $4.6 million. That was as of 2018. So I'm sure by now he's worth well over $5 million. And I believe his wife works for Goldman Sachs. So if he's trying to make it seem as if somehow celebrities in Hollywood are elitists, but not him, a rich multimillionaire U.S. senator, that's just, that's just idiotic. But Seth Rogen responded saying, Haha, ha, get fucked, fascist. Go encourage a white supremacist insurrection again, you fucking clown. I love this. He also <laughs> quote tweeted Ted Cruz and said, If you're a white supremacist fascist who doesn't find it offensive when someone calls your wife ugly, Ted Cruz is the exact motherfucker for you. Also, I'm in four unions. So this is hilarious, and this is what Ted Cruz deserves. Like, is there anyone who is a bigger clown in politics Besides Donald Trump, I mean, Ted Cruz now, in terms of people who have power, he's one of the biggest laughing stocks in the country. You just incited a riot a couple of weeks ago. There are folks calling for your expulsion from the U.S. Senate. And now all of a sudden you're tweeting out about how beautiful the national anthem is, as if you're so patriotic when you literally are a traitor to the United States. And then he's trying to very clearly like position himself as this anti-establishment figure because he wants to run for president in 2024. He wants to be the next Donald Trump. So he's trying to be pro-worker and pro-union. Meanwhile, anytime there's an opportunity for him to bust up unions, 
He's there like that. He's on that like stank on shit. So Ted Cruz is one of the biggest frauds in America, but yet he tries to appear edgy like he's this outsider. No, motherfucker, you are the ultimate elitist insider. You're a bigger elitist than any Hollywood celebrity because you have power and money. They only have power. So, uh, you know, it really is beautiful to see everyone collectively team up to shit on Ted Cruz. You love to see it. This is what I think is going to bring us all together our uh, collective hatred of this complete fucking imbecile, Ted Cruz. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did not attend President Biden's inauguration ceremony, and she had a very, very good reason for that. Before members of the media or even Republicans attack her for this, she had a great reason. And the reason is that she was setting an example for everyone else. She was standing with striking workers. So as Lucy Diavallo of Teen Vogue reports, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez skipped the January 20th inauguration festivities in Washington, D.C. for a strike. The congresswoman known as AOC showed up at Hunts Point Produce Market in the Bronx, just outside the border for Congressional District, to support a local Teamsters union whose workers are a big reason New York City has fresh fruit on a reliable basis. Claudia Irzaria Ponte, a reporter for the New York-based publication The City, who covers the Bronx, captured Ocasio-Cortez arriving at the picket line Wednesday evening with a pack of coffee and hand warmers wearing work boots. Irzaria Ponte also captured part of a speech AOC gave on a bullhorn at the picket. Ocasio-Cortez invited everyone to pull up and show solidarity with the union. Another clip from Gothamist WNYC news editor David Cruz captured more video of Ocasio-Cortez telling the workers their efforts are a way of asking for transformational change for workers across the United States. Speeches from Assemblymember Amanda Septi Timo and New York City public advocate Jumani Williams were also caught on tape. What we're doing here today is taking the upside down and making it right side up, Ocasio-Cortez told the crowd. What's the strike about? According to Irizaria Ponte's reporting for the city, the strike launched after negotiations broke down between the union and management over a $1 an hour raise. Management offered only 32 cents an hour as a raise, prompting the Teamsters Local 202 union to launch a strike Sunday night. In a January 16th statement, the union said the strike came after negotiations broke down when management refused to budge from a stingy offer for workers who kept New Yorkers fed through the pandemic. Now here's a clip of part of AOC's speech shared by the reporter who was mentioned. So this is really important because I, I think currently I'm not alone uh, in saying that the left is kind of lost right now. We don't really have a national leader. You know, Joe Biden is president, but Bernie is not the president. And sure, he does have power in government, but, you know, he's not the leader that he was during the primary. You know, he has a job to do. So the left kind of seems somewhat lost. I feel somewhat lost. But it's important that we get reminded what we need to do. And that's why I, I think that AOC standing in solidarity with striking workers is important because this is what the left has to do. For the next four years, we have to make it our goal to build power on the ground. We've, you know, gotten so close to the White House that, you know, we kind of thought maybe we can actually implement change from the top down, but it never works that way. It always comes from the bottom up. And the way that we actually institute change is by building power at the local level. And the Gravel Institute put out a phenomenal tweet explaining exactly how you do this. They write, Joe Biden is not our friend. We cannot beg him and the Democratic Party for table scraps. The left needs its own infrastructure, its own institutions, its own basis of power. Organize your workplaces, support local trade unions and tenants unions, and join groups like Democratic Socialists of America, support groups like Sunrise Movement, People's Policy 
Project and Progressive International that are building political coalitions for left policies and talk with other lefties where you live. So this is really important. You can make the biggest difference at the local level. Join DSA and if there's no chapter near you, start your own chapter. This is what you have to do. Like, we can't continue to remain isolated in our own bubbles. I mean, during the pandemic, we don't have much of a choice, right? But once this is over, there's no excuses. We have to organize. You know, find like-minded people in your area who believe in workers' rights, uh, you know, stand up for local workers and unions, organize your workplace, this is how we actually affect change. You build coalitions in your area and in effect build up your power. And then if we have a lot of organizing on the ground, hopefully the aggregate effect that we see nationally will be that we start to really make a difference because currently the left has a lot of ambitious plans, but we have no power. And the problem is that you can't really implement change if you have no power. And the way that you get power is to come together, organize. And this is how you do it. So AOC, it's important that she does this because she's leading by example. And look, whatever you can do to support organizations, you have to do it. So I joined DSA a couple of years ago. And it's important that these types of organizations that like field local candidates, that they have money and resources. You can also join, you know, groups such as the Sunrise Movement, which is a good recommendation because they push at the national level for very specific changes related to climate change we need to build our infrastructure that's one thing that's been lacking it's why we haven't been as effective and i think that as we kind of grow our collective base of power we will actually start to see more change at least somewhat quicker um so this is the way forward like we have to all recommit to organize at the local level organize with folks around us if we actually do want to see the change we're talking about so it starts by doing things like this, supporting these uh, sorts of efforts. So last week on the program, we talked about a story that was actually pretty alarming. So scientists were concerned that this new variant of COVID-19 would decrease the efficacy of vaccines, not make them useless, but just make them less effective. Now, this wasn't confirmed. We didn't know by how much if it did, in fact, decrease the efficacy of vaccines. However, according to one study, we are learning that at least when it comes to the Pfizer and BioNTech vaccine, that is not the case. It does not decrease the efficacy of that vaccine. So as Sam Meredith of CNBC reports, the coronavirus vaccine developed by Pfizer and BioNTech is likely to be just as effective against a highly transmissible mutant strain of the virus that was discovered in the UK, according to a study by the two companies. The variant known as B117 was estimated to have first emerged in the UK in September. It has an unusually high number of mutations and is associated with more efficient and rapid transmission. The characteristics of the variant had led to concerns about the effectiveness of COVID vaccines against it. However, research published on preprint server BioR14 showed no biologically significant difference in neutralization activity between the laboratory tests on B117 and the original strain of the coronavirus. The study, which has not yet been peer-reviewed, found that all of the mutations associated with the newly discovered variant were neutralized by antibodies in the blood of 16 participants who had previously been given the vaccine. So there's a couple of caveats. It's a relatively small sample size, and the studies, you know, Pfizer and BioNTech, they're the ones doing a study of their own vaccines, so we do need it to be peer-reviewed to know for sure, just so that way there's that separation there and a guarantee of impartiality. But this is really, really good news, and we're getting it quickly. Like, I was worried that it would take months for us to determine whether or not the vaccines would hold up against this new strain, but we're learning right away that it doesn't actually make a difference. This is everything. This is huge. Because if it were the case that this new variant actually did decrease the efficacy of vaccines, this means that it would take much longer to get the virus under control. And it really kind of made me feel uh, depressed, uh, you know, because to think that we finally get a vaccine and now that's undermined by this mutation, it just seems like when is it ever going to end? We see the light at the end of the tunnel and then all of a sudden it vanishes. But now, no, this is uh, absolutely phenomenal news. So I just wanted to give you all an update because I want to give you like the overall picture of what's happening with regard to COVID-19. I don't want folks 
to only see like the doom and gloom side, I do want you to see that there is some good news. I mean, currently we're in a really bad place with uh, deaths, with um, how many people are catching the virus, although thankfully it's starting to decrease, although we're still at really alarming levels in most states. But, you know, we are at a place where there is a light at the end of the tunnel and it's getting brighter and it's not dimming. Thankfully, this this uh, new strain is still going to be taken care of mostly by the vaccine. So I just had to share because this is absolutely phenomenal news. And certainly, you know, I'm breathing a sigh of relief after reading this story. Well, that's everything, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you've made it this far, as usual, we're not going to end the show without thanking all of the people who make this possible, all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members. Uh, so yeah, that is everything. Um, look, I'm a little bit sad that now that the Trump era is over, all of my Trump outros are now basically irrelevant. But having said that, though, I think it is only appropriate that we have uh, Donald Trump play us out one last time. I'll see you next week, folks. My name is Mike Figueredo. This has been The Humanist Report. Take care. Mike is a total loser, so don't hit the subscribe button, okay? And whatever you do, folks, do not hit the notification bell either. Mike treats me so unfairly.